we've been talking about matter as as if it is one thing right as if all matter around behaves similarly but clearly we see that there are say for example water is very different from a box is very different from the oxygen that we breathe what are all these matter if they are then clearly they're not very very similar right they behave completely differently right in one hand on one hand you have something like a box which you leave it there it'll remain there right and you try to like bend it or break it it's kind of resist that too much and then it kind of has a fixed shape right you can have a rectangular box a square box a round box a spherical box you know all of that you know when you have objects you can see, seem to play with their shape and they remain with that shape but you know that there is no meaning in saying rectangular water or spherical water it doesn't make much sense right because water just seems to be very very uh fluid in what it's doing and it's 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 a pretty uh, ironical thing to say but you know but what what does it do you wherever you put it it seems to occupy that that container and takes the volume of that container right and it takes the shape of that container water doesn't really seem to resist the change to its shape it doesn't seem to have any shape all the bruce lee fans would have heard this quote right be like water yeah what is he really saying we'll think about it yeah a resistance to change in your shape in his sense the identity so before you go into that knot let's ask another question on the other hand no these two are there right what about the ox or the air that we breathe right there also seems to have particles because the incense stick that you start off in some corner of the room that you burn in some corner of the room reaches everywhere else there is air carrying it around but it seems to behave in a even more different manner so our job here is to try and understand something that you already know and just to give labels to what you already understand because this is not away from your world it's exactly what you see every day except that we're going to label them so that you can talk about them to other people in an understandable manner right so let's start doing that the first one being the solid state yeah it's solid it's rigid even the way you say it means that it's going to be something that maintains its shape like a rectangular box a square box it's fixed its shape it resists a change to its shape great it has negligible compressibility or if you want it in a simpler way it has a fixed volume you can't change its volume right it has negligible compressibility you try to compress it you just can't do it Right. these are some characteristics right, that determine or that, that kind of show what solids really are they have a fixed volume they have a determined shape right so in other words what we really understand is that the bonds between them are quite strong they're really really strong and the more in the movement of these little particles right because we know matter is made up of particles the movement of these particles is not so much very very little so they're all compressed they're beautifully bonded in a way that gives them a fixed shape so in order to break them or change their shape you have to apply a large amount of force and after that they will break yeah most of them will break Great. So, if this was your definition of solids, then I saw some really interesting questions in the textbook. One of them being, then is a rubber band a solid? Right? You can very easily change its shape, then it comes back. Yeah. It doesn't seem to resist a change to its shape. Well, it's one special kind of a solid in one sense because it does resist. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to apply the force at all. Even though it's quite easier, it's easier compared to breaking or changing the shape of other solids. Doesn't mean that you're not applying a force. Right? You are applying a force. So clearly, rubber band is a solid. and it does retain its shape it comes back to its shape now definitely if it were in solid it would not be able to do that right you are you are expanding it it comes back to its shape of course after a point you do it really really you do it really hard it's going to break away and you might learn later on that it, even if it does not break away the larger and larger you uh, force you apply to pull it when it comes back it doesn't really come back to its original shape you might have already seen that right now that is something to do with what's called elasticity of the rubber band so we shall go into that not right now maybe a little bit later but what i want you to understand is that solids don't have to behave typically like a box that box that's rigid because i can also ask you the other question which is a sponge right yeah the one that you use the one that you see it's very easy to compress it seems to be so easy to compress it looks so big you can like compress it into such a small unit and then then you might ask what are you saying is a solid supposed to be non compressible its volume is supposed to be constant but the volume seems to be this large I compress it. I make it really, really small. That's a sponge, right? Now that is breaking our definition. So is the definition of solid stupid? Well, not really, because a sponge isn't really a solid in the true sense of the word. Because inside in the sponge, there are large number of air molecules stuck inside. In other words, there are little, little tunnels. If you have noticed the sponge, right? There are a lot of holes inside, which all have air. And when you press the sponge, what you're really doing is just squeezing the air out. Thereby, the the volume of the sponge as it is is not changing much. in fact it's not changing at all but the amount of air that gets stored inside is changing as you compress it so initially as it's really big there's a lot of air inside as you compress it the amount of air inside is now outside therefore it seems as if the sponge's volume reduced 
So these are some special solids. Now one more question that you must have right now is, let's take sugar or salt, right? In fact, the recent research that's happening is happening in these particles because these are a smooth transition between what we are going to call solids and liquids. Because they seem to behave like liquids, right? Because we've already, we're already pre-exposing you to what liquids really are. So you take a, a cup of sugar and you start pouring it. It falls down as if, as if it's water. It behaves similar to water. So what is the problem here? Is sugar a liquid or a solid? Well, tru truthfully speaking, a large number of little sugar particles kind of behave like water. But if you were to take a little sugar, one little piece of sugar and try to break it or try to start changing its shape, it'll resist it a lot. It has a fixed shape, right? It is fixed. You can go, go look really close. You'll notice that it's either, you know, it's a cuboid or it looks pretty much, it's usually a cuboid. So a sugar crystal is usually a cuboid. Or if you're playing with sugar cubes, you know that, you know, they are cubes. So you go inside, you notice that they have a fixed shape. Even though you put so many of them together and start pouring them out, they'll behave as if they are flowing. So does that mean they're not solid? Well, not really. At the individual level, they are solids. So as we spoke about what solids are, we've also pre-exposed you to what liquids are because you already know them. So now we're done with the solid state, right? The next is going to be what we call the liquid state, right? Now typically, the first example that will strike you when I say liquid is water, right? It flows, it occupies the shape of its container. Now the interesting thing about liquids is that they have a fixed volume. They are also very, very little compressible. They can't be compressed much. Even liquids have a fixed volume, except that they don't have a fixed shape. That's what differentiates solids from liquids majorly. A solid has a fixed shape, whereas a liquid only has a fixed volume. Right? It, can, it does not have a fixed shape. It's going to occupy the shape of any container you put it into. And now that is obvious, you already know that. You might think that liquids are also easily compressible, but they're not. You try to compress it, you want to play with this, you can take a syringe, put some water inside, just try pressing that syringe really, really hard. But no matter how hard you try, of course, you plug the front end, otherwise the water just flows out. But yeah, you start pressing it, what begins to happen is that you hardly get your way across. In other words, liquids are incompressible. This leads us on to our next state of matter, which is the air that we breathe. It's all around us, right? The gaseous state. So we saw the solids, the liquids, and now the gases. Now the gases are fundamentally different from these two in one way, which is that you cannot contain them at all. And there is, unless you close the container, right? The liquid, the container can be open. It has a surface, right? It's going to have a surface and it's going to remain there. It's not going to fly out. But if you keep a gas, until you close it in a container, it's going to escape out. It's going to occupy the largest volume possible. It's just going to occupy everything that it can. Yeah, it's, it's pretty greedy that way. You know, it's like the greedy conqueror. Gases are like the Alexander of the gas world, right? It's going to try and conquer everything possible. Yeah, you open it out, it's out there to every single place, which is why it's a lot easier to smell now, smells spread that quickly in air, don't they? Yeah? An instant stick or somebody uses a perfume in one corner of the room, wafts across to the entire room, right? Because gases occupy the space around them. They diffuse, it's called, very, very quickly, really quickly. So you have a gas, what does it do? It begins to start occupying the entire volume. Now, is a gas compressible? Highly compressible. Now, we might ask, what are, what are all these that we're saying? It sounds so much like rules, solids are this, liquids are this, gases are this. You know, suddenly, we're sounding like preachers who are telling you truths, but it all is boiling down to something very fundamental that differentiates these three. And that's what we're going to show you. So clearly, gases are compressible. So if you were to stop what we were doing there, they would just probably come back to their, you can push them to their original volume. So what have we seen here? Solids, liquids, and gases. Fixed shape, fixed volume no fixed volume. It'll occupy whichever volume you give it. So you see the progression there, right? Yeah. So this one has a fixed shape. This one has not even a fixed shape. This one has not even a fixed volume. Great. Now, if you were to put all this together, the one last mistake you might make, which will not let you do, is to think that all matter falls under these categories of solids or liquids or gases. Not true, right? This is what is called categorical thinking, where we divide nature into categories that fit into our model of the world. But what we know is that there's a smooth transition between solids to liquids to gases. And there are a lot of substances that fall on the borderlines of these, like we showed you, right? A lot of substances that fall on the borderlines. And these are just major categories to help us understand the world. So it's not that an object has to be either solid or liquid. Yeah. It, it, there's a smooth transition. Many of them 
have some properties of solids, some of liquids. Many objects have some properties of liquids and some properties of gases. And that's how it works. Now the next module, what we're going to see is that the same substance can change its state from solid to liquid to gas to liquid to solid based on some changes in its environment. Right? We could do something to, so to an object to make it go from one state to the other to the other. Now isn't that great? And we're going to show you how that's done. Now one last bit about gases that we told you is that they are highly compressible. But the one thing that we want to tell you is this makes it very convenient to be able to transport gases in a highly compressed form. One of the examples is liquefied petroleum gas or compressed or the other one is compressed natural gas, which is a way in which a lot of vehicles run today. Right? So compressed natural gas is where you take natural gas, which is in its gaseous form, compress it to a large amount so that you can transport it in little containers. Now, one little piece that we want you to know is that we showed you, right? Let's go back to the activity we did. And let's show you the way in which these, these balls of air are moving around. Do you notice that they are bouncing off the walls of that container? Do you notice that? Now, what we mean by a highly pressurized container, if you buy, even if you buy a Dio, Dio spray or something like that, it say it's a highly pressurized container. What it really means is that when you compress gas to a large amount, to a large extent and put it into a little volume, right? What happens is that you've increased what's called the pressure of the gas. But what leads to this pressure? What's the source of this pressure? Inside that little container, molecules of gas are going crazy, right? They are bouncing off every surface possible. And imagine if somebody was bouncing off a surface continuously, right? What would happen, right? The surface is going to feel a push, right? And if there are thousands of them pushing across, then per unit area, for some unit area, there's going to feel, there's going to be some force that's applied outwards. So the container is actually almost about to burst, except that the container has some strength, right? It's a solid. Yeah. So the good thing about the container is that it's solid. It wants to maintain its shape. So you increase the pressure a little bit more, it's going to break. Great. So the source of pressure for a gas comes out of the fact that these molecules of gas go and bang against the walls or the containers. And that's what creates this pressure. Now with that in mind, let's jump into our idea of changing state. Can matter change its state? In other words, can a solid become a liquid? Can a liquid become a gas? 